Okay, I guess, uh, let's see. Uh, Janet, can you hear me now? There's been a lot of commotion in here and I'm not sure. I just want to make sure you can hear me. I can, can hear, hear you now. What's that? I hear you now. Okay, that's good. Well, I, I had my I had my speaker off. There's a lot of noise in here. Okay, you have you have a speaker on here that is co-host. Yeah, that's, don't worry about that. I'll I'll explain that to you when I get home. Okay, that's one of the glitches that. Yeah. That okay. Okay. Okay, I, I got I it. Hear, I hear. You. Take your time. You got thirty seconds. <laughs> Hi, Jaron. Good to see you, buddy. Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful, isn't it? And it's sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and the sense of the heart. All scripture is, in fact, God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Study shows yourself approved under God, a work person that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word truth. Good morning, Adrian. Okay, let's see. Uh, take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound. You understand that. But what isn't understood by most Christians today, I'm sorry about this. I have to tell the truth. Many Christians are living, living a legalistic life. They're either self-righteously living the Christian way of life or a trend toward asceticism, strong trend. that's causing them to do, motivating them to do the right thing. But if you do it, not doing it in the right way, that is operation cry. Some are getting it, some aren't. But there's coming a day when we'll all meet Jesus face to face at the Bema seat. If in fact you're a born again Christian, if you're here today and you're not a born again Christian, this is this simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Eternal salvation. However, the next step is to meet him at the Bema seat prior to living your Christian life. Living your Christian life is an absolute essential. I'm amazed, again, at the number of people who are playing the game of Christianity. I know you aren't, but I want you to understand that they are out there and they need our assistance. They need our lifestyle. So with that in mind, we have a passage of scripture coming up here. They just knocked the ball out of the park. I call it a body bonds. It doesn't go into the stands. It goes into the ocean. And it's going to give you a glimpse of what the Christian way of life is really all about. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I'll close out our prayer time and pick up our study right where we need to begin. Father, I thank you for enable me to walk through the glitches again this morning. Uh, it's amazing. But anyway, we're ready to go. And I'm grateful that you were able to give me the time to get set up to be able to speak the truth so that the spirit of God can confirm this information in our human spirit. We can take it and move it to the launching pad of our soul and wait for the circumstance to come along. Probably isn't going to be too long, Father, for it to come along where we're going to have to use it. So with that in mind, let's move on to the teaching of your word. It's your word, and I'm grateful to be able to share it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, here's what we're doing. You have your notes in front of you. You don't have this. They're right here. And the, the information here comes out of 2 Peter. Peter is actually nearing the time of his death. He's teaching the word of God. He's got disciples around him. Here it is. Introductory comments before we get to the passage of scripture, 15 verses. How do you get through 15 verses? I can't get through seven, but we got 15 today. I'm gonna to do my best to do this because of the significance of the information that is contained in this passage. First of all, the dying words of Peter are recorded in first Pe in the chapter one of first Peter. That's where we are. We're gonna be in chapter one and the dying words of Peter are going to be given to us. And you can't imagine, oh, you maybe you can, uh, I don't say you can't imagine what he is going to tell these people to whom he is writing because he is getting ready to die. He is, he's been teaching them the word. 
He wants them to know after he's gone what he has said because it's information that will carry, carry them on in the rest of their life. So these are Peter's dying words in chapter one. Now I have a question here. What is Peter's purpose in chapter one? Okay, if he's dying, he's writing, writing three chapters of information. What is his purpose? Well, the answer is Peter's purpose in chapter one is to establish a principle. Remember, principles, promises, doctrines, techniques, rules for living. That's the guidelines of the Christian way of life. The Christian way of life, entire Christian way of life, will be contained in principles, promises, doctrines, techniques, and rules for living. Five different categories of truth. So Peter is going to establish a principle of life for us to understand. And I want you to understand that when we go out the door here today, I can't, don't care what your problems are. I don't care what your cares are. I don't care what your concerns are. As a man who loves you dearly, I want you to know the truth. How do you handle these circumstances of life? Maybe good, maybe bad, maybe indifferent, whatever, whatever they are. I want you to be able to handle them. It's amazing the phone calls that I get from here, from there, from somewhere else. I, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, I'm not a psychologist. I'm, I don't have the gift of counseling. But when there are few counselors out here to be able to help people who are struggling through life, guess what? I get a call. Two o'clock in the afternoon, seven o'clock at night, two o'clock in the morning. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not embellishing this thing. People are looking for answers, no matter where you go. I went out this past week to take some stuff out to have a job done. I got there and had two people of a denomination you can't believe that within 10 minutes time, they're asking me, where do you meet? Where do you meet? I want to bring my wife and come to see you. It's that bad out there. People are looking for answers. I know you're going to have them. So what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to tell you something you've only heard 500 times from me. Not quite that many, but almost. Now, point number three, point number three. Here's another question. Point two is a question. What is Peter's purpose? It's going to be established a principle. So the question then is what, what is the principle that Peter is going to try to establish? Well, a principle. What we're going to do is we're going to find that principle in four points. We're going to find the principle in four points. However, there may be a few more than that because I may have that number wrong. Let's go into point number four. The, here, here it is. The criterion. Sometimes when you're, sometimes when I'm talking, and listen, this is not to, uh, not to disparage you. It's not to criticize. I, I know that there are people out here who have a limited vocabulary. So sometimes when I throw in a word and say, wait a minute, let's, let, what does that really mean? So let's take a look here. The criterion, what is the criterion? That means the standard for the Christian life is what the word of God, now listen to this, let me move this up here so I can get it out of the way. Okay, the standard for Christian life is what the word of God says, is that clear? The standard for the Christian life is what the word of God says, not what Jim Bertel says, not what someone else says, not somebody over here, what they said. It's what the word of God says. Now, the issue here is that I should be able to tell you clearly what the word of God is saying. Otherwise, I'm failing you as a pastor. This is why I spend the time studying that I do to make sure that when I open my mouth and give you information, it will be accurate unless I mistype with these two fingers, okay? Now, point number four, five, you haven't really advanced. This is, this is a, an issue that you and I and every other born again Christian need to realize. You haven't advanced one step in your life from babyhood. You haven't, you haven't advanced one step from babyhood to adolescence to spiritual adulthood. You haven't advanced one step in your Christian life until Bible doctrine is more important. Now listen, is more important and more real to you than anything else in life. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus would hold it just a second. If you don't know the word of God, you don't know who Jesus is. He's just some guy walking down the street here trying to convince you he's something he isn't. No, no, no. No, the word of God is going to tell you exactly, precisely what we ought to be believing. So in point five, you haven't really advanced in your Christian life until Bible doctrine is more real to you 
than anything in life. Now, what do we mean by anything in life? Look here. Bible doctrine has to be more real than what you see. Well, wait a minute. I see Samson sitting there. That's Samson Harris. Oh, yes, that's real. But Jesus has to be more real than him if we're going to make it in the Christian way of life. So the idea is, what do you see out of it? You see a tree, you see a car, you see money, you see your wife, you see this, you see that. Listen, all that may be important to you, but until you understand what the word of God is saying to you, you may have a great life, you think, here. But again, when you meet Jesus at the beam seat or at the great white throne, if you never find out who Jesus is, it's going to be a sad day for you. How about this? Bible doctrine has to be more real than what you touch. I reach out every morning and I touch my wife. I see she's still there. Wow. I get up and I look and I touch this. I touch that. Oh, it's so, it's so real. The word of God has to be more real than what I'm touching out here. Oh, that's the reality. No, it's reality, all right. But there's something more real than that, and it's the Word of God, because the Word of God is going to guide your life. I ask you, where in the world, those of you online on Facebook, those of you on, on WebEx, those of you whoever, where you're listening, what, how important is the Word of God to you? Oh, I read my Bible every day. Well, fine. What's it say? Well, I'm not quite sure. I need somebody to help me. How about this? Bible doctrine has to be more real than what you hear. Now, we're not talking about hearing here, except for the fact that if I'm giving you false doctrine, the word of God has to be more real to you than what you hear from me or what you're hearing from them. Oh, listen, there are five great Bible teachers on the Internet. I see them every day. I'm taking notes just as fast as I can. Well, that's fine. That's OK. But is what you're hearing correct? Well, I'm not really sure. Then why are you listening? See? This is, this is a real deal. This is not some game we're playing. I know you know that. Bible doctrine has to be more real than what you hear, yes. How about this? Bible doctrine also has to be more real than what you taste. Ooh, spaghetti dinner last night, Ooh, cabbage rolls. What is it? I know you had a good meal last night, but listen, you're not gonna get to heaven by eating that meal. It'll keep you alive so you can find a doctrine to get there, I guess. But see the idea here at point number five, you, ha you haven't really advanced in your Christian life until Bible doctrine. And you know, sometimes I hear that, that, that word Bible, you can't believe how, how many times the word Bible doctrine is turning off people. You know why? Bible doctrine is associated with R.B. Thame. 90% of the world, Christian world, hates R.B. Thame. Well, that's fine. But he gave me a whole lot of information I've passed on to you that's working for you, so I think it's pretty good, okay? Now, I believe that at this point in time, we have some insight today that he didn't have. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But when you do it and it works, you know that it's true and you know it's real. So I want to indicate to you then Bible doctrine. So, so what I do, sometimes I'll say doctrine, but sometimes you say doctrine, what the doctrine of what? The doctrine of equality, the doctrine of this, the doctrine of something else. No, 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 no. That's the world's idea. I'm talking about biblical principles, promises, doctrines, techniques, and rules for living. The word of God. Stop and assess yourself. I know you're here because you came to, to get the word of God. I don't think you came to see me. I don't think you came to hear me. Well, you did come to hear me, but, uh, but I'm not the focal point, okay? It's the word of God. Now, point number six. When Bible doctrine is more real to you than these four, than these four bullet points. See, that's that what up here. Uh, here's the principle, and I the principle went down to point five there. So here's the issue in point in point number uh, point number yes in point number six. When Bible doctrine is more real to you than these four bullet points, what you see, what you touch, what you hear, and what you taste, then and only then. Then, and what's the next two words? Only then. I'm told, I, I, I don't know whether, I don't know whether you realize this, but I have somebody who tells me I, I, I use adverbs. I use adverbs like they're going out of style, you know? And it's, what do they say? I, I don't say many times. I say many, many times. Very, very much. And it's simply to emphasize what we're doing here. I want us to understand this again. This is not just a game. This is life. Okay. So point six, 
when those when those four bullet points are, are more important to you than anything else in life, now you're beginning to know, now you have normal Christian living. Doctrine number one. Now, point number six is the issue in this study today. What is the issue in this study today? When Bible doctrine is more important to you, more real than those four bullet points, then you have arrived at normal Christian living. Now, remember, normal Christian living is not just doing the truth. It's doing what? It's doing the right thing. How? In the right way. And the right way is doing it from the source of your new man or your new woman, doing it from, sor from the source or residence in the sphere of the spirit, not filled with the spirit, but living in the sphere of the spirit. And you get there by way of Operation Cry, preceded by rebound. My mind is racing. Okay, here we go. Point number eight. This is just introductory information, okay? Point eight. The whole purpose of this chapter, chapter one, Peter, the whole purpose of chapter one is to block what? Block what? Discouragement. To block discouragement in your life before it occurs. Now stop here. If you are aware of all that's going on in our country and around the world, I'm not being political, okay? I'm not being political. I want you to understand what's going on in the world in terms of the reversionism, the attempt to, to stymie, your life as a Christian, listen, Samson, it's going to get worse, buddy. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So the question is, when everything as it's in the slide of falling apart today, what are you going to do and how are you going to manifest your life when it f hits the bottom and crashes? That's discouragement. If you're not living the Christian, the normal Christian life, when you look out today and you look at the lives of people, it's discouragement here, discouragement there, discouragement there. It's worry here, worry there. I saw something posted on internet last night in a doc, in a doctrinal in a doctrinal website where they were talking about we have to worry every day. What? Hold it. If you're worrying, you're out of fellowship with God. I don't care what the circumstance is. I don't care how bad it is. You understand that? Please? Please? I know you understand. I'm preaching the choir out here. You understand this? I understand that you see. I want to encourage you. This is serious business. Okay, let's move on from that. Point number nine. See, Peter wants us to block discouragement. Now, listen, every day we're going to be faced with circumstances that could be discouraging. Health, money, food, supplies, gas. That's for your car. What? See, many, many things. You probably come up a hundred more of what could be discouraging, discouraging if it's not going the way you want it to. Okay, now point number nine. This is still introductory. The Bible has many examples. The Bible has many examples of consequent of the consequences of our own failures in life. So if if you're reading through the Bible, and I would encourage you to do so, you'll learn the history. You'll 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 be refreshed in terms of what you've already learned. But as you go through the Bible, you don't have to get too far in the Book of Genesis till you find things falling apart. Right outside the Garden of Eden. Well, as a matter of fact, it started in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? So what happens is living living in a fallen world with no doctrine, you're trying to solve the problems of life, your problems, the problems of somebody else, the problems of the world. You're trying to solve them without any doctrine up here that comes from God. And so what you have is failure here, failure here, failure here, failure here. And guess what? When there is failure, God isn't necessarily going to punish you 
But what God will do is he will bring some pressure to your life, pressure to your life to help you to understand something isn't right in your life. And that's to draw you back to the word of God or lead you to the word of God where you can handle these failures in your life. So the idea is if you don't think that failures are possible, look in the Bible and see the failures of men, women, people in the Bible, and look at the consequences of those failures. So here's the idea. The Bible has many examples of the consequences of our own failures in life. Well, I see he did that. That's what I'm doing. Ooh, look what happened to him. That's what's happened to me. Has many examples of the consequences of our own failures in life, but it's wrong. It's wrong to assume. Listen, it's wrong to assume that it's impossible to recover from your failures. How many people do I know today? I can't count them. But how many people do, do I know today that can't get over their past? Get that? You say, well, I look back at my life and had a good, good upbringing. Well, I was just fine, a good mom and dad. They gave me principles for life. I didn't know I had a trend toward asceticism, and that's why I wasn't doing all that bad stuff these other people were doing. But you know what? How about this one over here that just messed up his life? How about this, this one over here that's messed up his or her life? How about Jim Bertel looking at his own life back there and saying, oh, man, how do I overcome that? You understand what I'm, where I'm coming from? Here's the issue. And point number nine, the Bible has many examples of, con of the consequences of our own failures in life. But it's wrong for you, it's wrong for me, it's wrong for anybody else to assume that it's impossible to overcome or to recover from your failures. Why don't you take a look at some of those people in the Bible who become saints of God? Look at what they did. I'm afraid to call out some of them because it's probably something you did, something I did. And I'm not gonna attack you at all. But I think we need to be honest with ourselves. Then point number 10, dogmatically, Peter then wants us to understand that there is no such thing as failure for which who or what? For which what? Grace. What is grace? It's God's provision. God has provided. There's no circumstance of your life, no failure for which grace has not already been provided. I have a question. <clears throat> when did God provide the solution to your failure? Three weeks ago? In, e in eternity past. That's exactly right. Isn't it amazing? See, this is why this is why it's so important to understand Cell Junior Live, isn't it? Someone says, Cell Junior Live. Let's see what chapter is that in? Well, you know what that is. It's the, it's the characteristics of God. So it one of the passages that we see here, it says, look, how can you go anywhere if you don't know who God is? How can you go anywhere if you don't know who Jesus is? We need to know them both. We need to know the spirit of God because there's our help. So point number 11, <clears throat> the fact that some believers do not recover, at least the fact that some believers do not recover from failures, failure, or failures in their life is the fact that they do not possess or they reject the biblical answer to their failures. Okay. Now we're gonna remember something here. This is important to us. <coughs> there is no problem in life. Got that? No problem in life for which the knowledge of Bible doctrine will not bring you the solution. Anybody got any idea of some kind of a circumstance in life where God doesn't have a solution? He's got solutions to everything that could ever happen in our life. And he's known about it since eternity past. Okay. Now we've gone through our 12 introductory points. Let's move on from here. Now we begin with the verses. In this first couple of verses, 
we're just going to get sort of like an introduction. Peter's talking here. So it says, I'll, I'll read the, um, I'll read the, uh, just the emboldened part, which is the verse, and then we'll come back and, and exposit it. It says, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Who is he writing to? He said, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. How did they get it? By the righteousness of our God and even and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let's go back and take a look and see what that's saying. First of all, the word, the word bond servant. I'm going to tell you something here. Something that I grasp, that I wrestle with every day. I want you to look around and see who's in this room today. We have Caucasians. We have black people. I don't know there are any Hispanics at this point in time. But you people have been dear, so dear to me all of my life, all my pastorate. I don't know whether I should call this a fear or not. I'm not going to use the word concern. But the fear, if that's what it is, if it is, I'll confess it and get over it. The, the, the hurt and pain in my heart is that when I tell you the truth, that tomorrow you won't be back. So that when I have to talk about things that might be political, when I talk about things that have, might have to be, might be, be necessarily racial, to get the truth out there, I've got to say it. But the pain in my heart is that when I do, if I lose you, it will be a broken heart, but I'll tell you what. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to to apply what I just said here. There's no circumstance of my life that God hasn't already provided the solution for. So with that in mind, I'm. I'm when I when I. Simon Peter, a bond servant. The, the word bond servant. There's just one word in the Greek. It's doulos. And it actually means slave. So I thought, okay, now I, I'm going to be criticized, not by anybody here, not by anybody here. But I'm going to be criticized. Let's see now. This is another one of those things where the mouse isn't working. Okay, hang on just a moment. Okay. I should bring it up. Okay, hang hang with me just a moment. There we go. Over here on this right hand side, do loss. I want to make sure that everybody understands. People on WebEx, people on YouTube, whoever comes to me, I want you to understand that when I use this word bond servant and realize that it, that word means slave. It doesn't have anything to do with slavery in the past in this country. It has nothing to do with anything like that. This has everything to do with your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, period. So the word doulos actually means slave. And I give the whole in, this information down the right-hand side so that you can read it. I'm not gonna read it, you can do that. So that you can read it and understand exactly what that word do loss and bond servant means. Bond servant means slave, okay? Now watch. Peter says, I am a bond servant, I am a slave. And here's the interesting thing, that any communicator of the word of God becomes a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. That means he says, this is what you do. And I say, yes, sir, and I go do it. If I don't go do what he says, I'm out of fellowship with him. I'm dishonoring him, I'm dishonoring his plan, and I have no reason to believe that God is going to grace me out in this life as long as I'm living that kind of a lifestyle, okay? 
So all communicators of God's word are God's slaves. Now, the truth of the matter is born again Christians are also, but this just happened to be this and this in this part of the verse. So he says, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle. The apostle is a temporary spiritual gift. Why do I say that temporary? Because you've got people out here who believe that they are apostles. There are no apostles since 96 AD. Now, it's an apostle of Jesus Christ, indicating that Peter is going to get his authority from Jesus Christ. Now, what is he doing? He's writing to whom? To those who have received a faith of the same kind, the same kind as us. That is the same kind as a Peter and other apostles. Now, notice here it says, to those who have received, how do they receive it? They receive what they receive. They received this faith by grace. It was God's provision. This, is, this isn't something they worked up on their own. This is something they realized, hmm, there's something out here I didn't realize I couldn't do myself. Oh, there it is. God's provided. It's a grace provision. He goes on. And they, how long do they have this thing, this faith? They're going to have it forever. Here's one of the reasons why you need somebody. If you don't do it yourself, you need somebody to help you study the word of God. Here's this next word. He said, to those who have received a faith, and believe it or not, you have, you've received this. You may not know what it was, but the, the word faith here is actually be, be, because of the, the Greek construction. This actually means an equal honor faith, equal honor faith. Now, what in the world is an equal honor faith? You know that we've talked about three categories of faith, inhale faith, exhale faith, and the faith, the body of doctrine to be believed. This equal honor faith is actually inhale faith and exhale faith. Inhale faith, you take in the word of God. Exhale faith, you apply it, and e they have equal honor. They have equal responsibility. If you get rid of inhale, exhale is worthless. If you get rid of it or get inhale and get rid of exhale is worthless. So this word faith here actually actually means an equal honor faith, and it's referring to both inhale and exhale faith. You have received this in your life, okay? So he says, to those who have received a faith, and, and that's equal, that's uh equal honor faith of the same kind. Now watch this. The same kind here, that phrase same kind actually means equally precious, equally precious. So the issue, I, if, I, if I were to ask you then, um, if I ask you, Samson, for example, if, if inhale faith and exhale faith have, they're equal in, uh, in their preciousness, which one's more precious than the other? They're the same, aren't they? They're the same. So he says here, though, to those who have received a faith of the same kind, and that same kind means equally precious. Okay. Then he goes on to say, as ours, our apostles, he said, not by the righteousness. How did they receive this? They received it in the sphere of righteousness. See, they manifested faith in Jesus Christ. God, God, the Holy Spirit picked them up out of Adam, put them in Christ, and now they have positional righteousness. They're positionally sanctified in that sphere of righteousness. This is where they are, and that gives them that gives them the, the ability then to have this equal honor faith, okay? So he says, of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of God, even our Savior. So here's the issue. Peter is a bond, he's a slave to Jesus Christ. He's an apostle. He has actually received this equal honor faith. You have it also. You've received it also. How did it come? It came by righteousness that came through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse 2. Grace, which is God's provision. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Stop right there. He says, grace and peace. Grace is God's provision. Now, hold on now. Grace is God's provision. What is peace? Peace is ment mental stability. Question, do you have, are you stable mentally in every circumstance of your life? I am here. I, yeah, I got it here. Oh, I got it. 
why'd you bypass this one over here? What? Uh, no, no, you caught me, didn't you? Is there some place in your life where there is not a mental stability? You're worried, you're anxious, you're angry, you're bitter, you're envious, you're upset, you want to retaliate. Where? What is it? I hope not. He says grace and peace, God's provision and mental stability. Now watch this. He says be multiplied to you. Hmm. I guess if it has to be multiplied to you, you don't have it all run in, do you? You see that? If it, if some, if something has to be multiplied to you, you don't have it all yet. So it's going to be here. here. What's that mean? That means as you grow, as you grow, you're going to be able to have this same kind, this same kind of stability, grace, and peace in your life. More provision, more mental stability. The more I grow, the more I'm able to handle the circumstances of my life. So God's grace and peace be multiplied to you. How are you going to get this grace and peace? How are we going? How am I going to receive this multiplication of grace and peace? He said, in the knowledge, and that word knowledge there is epinosis, and it means full knowledge. Where do you get a full knowledge? You get it from the word of God, and then the Holy Spirit teaches you what that means down in your human spirit. It comes back up into the frame of reference, and you say, oh, ho, that's what that means. Uh, I don't believe that. You throw it aside. But as soon as you say, yes, that's it. The light bulb turned on. I know that's it. I believe it. Right down into the into your clothes closet. It goes in as vocabulary, categories, builds your conscience, down on the on the launching platform. Here comes the circumstance. Yes, bingo. You apply it out here. Victory in the Christian life. Okay. So it comes to this grace and knowledge, peace rather, is going to come to us in the knowledge full knowledge of god i see who you are father i see you i see your plan your purpose your will for my life wait a minute jesus yeah he said don't talk just to me he said how about this one over here it was you're right jesus you followed the plan you died for me you made all this possible for me but again that's not where the christian way of life is is it not there let's see now verse three Whoop. See, the mouse isn't working. Okay. See, it's a precisely correct procedure. If I touch the wrong spot, it's going away. Now in verse three, in verse three. Now we're going to start to get into something here. In verse three, he says, for his, that's God, God the Father. He said, for his divine power. Well, what is his divine power? Cell so Junior I. Junior I. What is this divine power? What what O is it? Omnipotence. See, that's his divine power. For God's divine power has granted, and that means he's freely given, he's freely given this. No strings attached. For his divine power granted to us. Everything granted to us is to our advantage, to our advantage. You see that word us there, that phrase to us? That's a date of case, and that's a date of advantage, which means then that what God has granted us through his divine power is to our advantage, okay? And what has he given us? He's, my goodness, listen, for his divine power has granted to us a few things pertaining to life. Is that what that says? Is that what it says? What's it say? He has provided everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. Now, notice he's provided everything. That means that in the Christian way of life, you have a circumstance. There's the blank check. You just write the check and make the withdrawal. See, this is why I indicated from the, from the very beginning of our Christian life, from eternity past, God has already provided everything we ever need. So the, why is it, why is it then that we're saying, God help me, God help me, 
God, I need this. God, I need that. No, he's already provided it. We need to know the word of God. The word of God is going to tell us what's in the bank. And guess what we have to do? We go make a withdrawal. And how do you do that? By faith. There it is. By faith, I believe it. And by faith, inhale, I believe it. Exhale, I apply it. And there's your victory at that point. For his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life. That's physical life. What do you need in physical life? Well, I need a new car. Why do you need a new car? He said, there's a, I'll get you. I'll get you there. Just a second. Maybe you don't need to get there right now. Well, apparently not, because I can't get there. It's his God plan. It's his will. He's provided everything pertaining to physical life. And godliness, spiritual life. So if you're looking for something in life, remember, well, I don't have what I need. Well, then maybe you don't understand the plan. Because in the plan, you don't need that. Okay. Well, uh, Lord, I need this, this spiritual provision here for my spiritual life. I, he said, well, yep, there it is. It's all down there in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. Now watch what he says. He's provided everything pertaining to, 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 uh, to spiritual life and physical life. Now the next six words are going to tell you how to receive everything God has granted. Remember, multiply. We don't have it all in the front end. You're going to multiply it. He says, here it is. He said, here's how you're going to get all this. He said, through the true knowledge, that's epinosis again. Through, and by the way, that true knowledge is just one word. True knowledge, epinosis, through the epinosis knowledge of him, God the Father, who called you. Hold it just a moment. That word called. That word called means God in eternity past with his omniscience. Look down into, look down into human history. Uh, see, everybody in the room right now, he saw, he saw us, there, there you are, and what does it say? He chose you, he elected you, he elected you, he chose you, he invited you into his plan. Why did he invite you? See, this, this is a misunderstanding here. Many people believe that you were elected so that, uh, uh, that make any difference. Whether you believe or not, God elected you. There, I chose you. No, he chose you because what? Because he saw you choose his son. Okay? So we've been elected. Now, he says we, ha we have to know that through the true knowledge of him, God the Father, who called us, God chose you and me. And how did he, cho how did he choose us? He chose us by his own glory. Question. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is not that he had this, he had this, he had something else, he didn't have this. It's his essence. Cell junior UI. There is the glory of God. That's the thing that makes him who he is. All of his essence. Okay? So it says, through the true knowledge of him who called us, who called us by his own glory and his excellence, his virtue, his moral goodness. His moral goodness and his, his essence is what it took for him to call us. He saw us, believed, he chose us. Now watch this, verse 4. Through these, now watch this. He said, through these, God's glory and his virtue, from the previous verse, he, God the Father, has granted us. Come on. Sorry. Through these, he, God the Father, has granted us, you and I as believers, what has he granted? His, God the Father's, precious and magnificent promises. What has he given us? He's given us promises. What kind of promises are they? He said they are they're precious. That means they're valuable. Valuable for what? Not for resale but valuable for use in the circumstance of life. Here you are, you have, you have a, a circumstance where you've just fallen apart. The circumstance has fallen apart. Question, are you falling apart? Are you going to handle it? Well, God's given us promises to be able to handle this. Not only, that, not only are, they prom are they valuable, they're also magnificent, which means they are, they are large, they're huge in number. They're not limited. These are magnificent problems. They're, they're, they're numerous, okay? 
so that by them, you, me, as a, as a believer, what are we going to do? We may, we may become partakers of the what? Become, we, we become partakers of the what? Of the, one more time, of the what? Of the divine nature. You know what that is? That's the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. So by these promises, by this mental stability, by this grace, his provisions, his, his, the mental stability that we have from all of these provisions, we are able to be a partaker of divine nature. Jesus Christ is our model. Moving on. He says, then, having escaped, having escaped the corruption that is in the world on account of lust. Now, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that, the last part of that verse. He tells us here that the Christian way of life, when you're taking in the word of God, you, you are, you're, you're privileged to receive these grace provisions from God. You are assimilating them. You are appropriating these grace provisions. You are growing in the Christian way of life. And you look back and you say, wait a minute, what a difference. What a difference a day makes, one day at a time. Look where I am now, as opposed to where I was before I became a born-again Christian. You see, prior to, the, prior to the being saved, where were you? You were living your life from the old, and the influence of the old sin nature, from the source of the old man or the old woman, functioning in the flesh, in a world that is what? In a world that is corrupt. This is where we're fighting the battle in the angelic conflict. We're not going to straighten this mess out out here. God's going to straighten out the mess that's in here. That's what the Christian way of life is. So what? watch what he says. He says, now that you are saved, he said, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. Having escaped from the ultimate source of corruption, we have, we have escaped from the old sin nature. How did you escape from the old sin nature? Remember what Romans 6, 6 says? Romans 6, 6 says, indicates that we have crucified. We've crucified the flesh. The moment that we became a born again Christian, we looked back to the cross and our, our old man, our old woman was on that cross with Christ. There's your escape from God's viewpoint in Romans 6, 6. He said, I'm going to share, share something with you to show you how you've escaped this corruption. You went back here to the cross. Your sins have been paid for. Your old man, functioning in the sphere of the flesh, under the influence of the old sin nature, has been crucified with Christ. Now, guess what? When you know that you have a new man, a new woman in you, you begin to live from that. And guess what? Experientially, you have just escaped the corruption of this world. See, it has everything to do with how we live. It's called the cosmos here. It's the world system under the leadership of Satan. Let's move on to the next page. Verse five. He said, now for this very reason. Now, if you see, now for this very reason. Now, you might want to go back after class and read this stuff again. Think about it. He says, now for this very reason, what, what is it that's the reason? Everything that he has said in verses two and four, you have the grace, you have the, the mental stability. He said, uh, we, we, your old man has been crucified back there. You've been liberated from the world out here. So for this very reason, God has provided you with grace and peace, verse two. He has provided you with everything pertaining to life and godliness, verse three. He's provided his precious and magnificent promises, verse four. Now in verse five through seven, he says, look, now that you have this grace and peace, now that you have everything provided for pertaining to life and godliness, now that you have all my precious and magnificent number of promises, he said, I want you to add something to that. Dennis, do you see why now at the beginning of the class, I said we're going to get a good picture of what the Christian way of life is all about. And if, if we've got to get past the idea, I know you're not there, but we've got to get past the idea that people out here necessarily, and there are some out there doing the right thing in the right way, 
But the majority of people who call themselves Christians, unbelievers can't do this, but Christians going to just going through the motions of their Christian way of life, they don't understand what life is all about. So he says, for this very reason, here's what the, here's the things that you, you have. Now he says, I want you to add some things. And here's what he wants us to add. He says, also, and what follows is what you're going to, to begin to add. And by the way, this word add is not in the scripture, but there's a word in the scripture that's a Greek word that means that although that word isn't there, it means you have this and this and this. Now add this, then add this, then add this, then add this. The word add's not there. But it's implied in a in a specific word back before this that indicates what follows now is you're going to add to this, add to this, add to this, add to this. You're just you're growing in this stuff. So here's what we're going to do. The first thing we're going to add, he says, applying. Now what? No. Here's how you're going to do it. He said, applying all diligence. Now what does that mean? That means here's something that I want you to do. Okay, you reach out there and eh, what well, didn't work? Uh, uh, that didn't work again. There it is. I got it now. Here's what he says. He said, apply all diligence. Make every effort. Now, what follows is how to do the what. See, this is what you're to do. What am I supposed to do? If I'm going to add these things to what I saw in verse 2, 3, and 4, how, how am I going to add this? I'm only going to add these things by adding diligence, by being diligent, applying diligence, making every effort. Do you understand that making every effort doesn't mean that it's going to be easy? You see that? This isn't going to be easy. There are going to be, there are going to be setbacks that try to get you to be set back. So here it is. What are you going to do? You're going to apply diligence. That's the what. That's the how. And, and the what is this. You're going to do this by means of faith, your faith, doctrine. So how are you going to add these other things? You have these things in verse 2, 3, and 4. He wants you to add these things to 5, 6, and 7. But how am I going to add them? He said you're going to do it by means of your faith, doctrine. Now watch what he says. By, by doctrine, he said supply. And that word supply means add. So what are we going to add? He said add moral excellence. You know what that means? That means that when I look at you, when I look at you, Marshall, when I look at you, Dwayne, when I look at you, Kitty, as born again Christians, as I as we look at each other, he said, I want you to add these things. And this, the first thing he says is moral, moral excellence. And that moral excellence is virtue. And what is virtuous? What is what does virtue mean? It means you you need to add doing the right thing in the what in the right there's virtue virtue is goodness how do you add virtue in your life it's by doing the right thing in the right way you okay are you okay Andy? okay so the first thing you're going to do he said you have these things here now add moral excellence now do you see what he said here to begin it? he said how are you going to get it he said you have to apply diligence that means you have to make you have to make every effort to do this. Okay, then he says, now that you have this moral excellence, virtue, he said, add the second thing. He said, and that's knowledge. And that word knowledge there is the word gnosis. And we know that gnosis generally means it's just information out there. But the word gnosis that it applies here includes the whole nature and design of Christianity. So what are we going what are we going to add to this? We've got this moral virtue here. This is just moral goodness, doing the right thing in the right way. But he wants us to add, he wants us to add the whole nature and design of Christianity. What's Christianity all about? Well, it's about resolving a spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. How are we going to do it? The only way we can do it is to live, live the word of God. You've got to get the word of God. You've got to know what the plan, the will, purpose of God's life is for you. And then go out there and do it. But you don't do it overnight. It's a growth process. Now, he says, we're going to add from moral excellence, we're going to add knowledge. That's the whole nature and design of God's plan. Then he says, and in your knowledge, which is includes the whole nature of God's 
plant designed for Christianity. He said, add self-control. What is self-control? Self-control is the ability to control your feelings and overcome your weaknesses. Stop there. The ability to overcome your feelings. I'm jealous. I hate. I'm bitter. I'm envious. I'm whatever, okay? To overcome your weaknesses, your feelings. Then he says, now that you have the self-control, see, we're adding these things. You don't get them all at once. You add them. Then he says, and in your self-control, add perseverance. Hmm. That's patient endurance in the field of mentality. That means you're going you're gonna to keep the right mental attitude and you're going to keep on trucking. You're going to keep on moving. You're not going to be swayed one way or the other. You're going to move straight ahead. Then he says, and now that you have the perseverance, he said, in your perseverance, add godliness. Oh, my. That's a willingness to follow the concepts laid down by God. Then he says, and in, in godliness, he said, let's add brotherly, brotherly kindness. And what is brotherly kindness? That's strong capacity for love. You know, when I, when I sort of bared my soul here a little while ago, this is this is a strong capacity for love. That's 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 the love that we have for each other. You know that you you understand that. But then the next one from brother uh, from brotherly kindness. See this the brotherly kindness like that or love. We're friends. We're friends. But what happens if my friend just did something that was harmful to me? What do I do? Take the next one. Agape love, see the relaxed mental attitude. That's the attitude where you you allow them to demonstrate their freedom, and they did the wrong thing. But in spite of that, I'm going to agape love you. See, that's exactly what God does for us. He, he looks down and sees you doing the right thing. He says, "Boy, I'm proud of that." Then you, he sees you do something wrong. Your negative pollution. Well, he doesn't just wipe you out. His agape love for the entire world allows you to keep on keeping on until he's willing to take you out of here. But there's these these six things. Now look here, the six things that we've just added. We had we had some others back there in verse two, three, and four. Now in verse five, six, and seven, we've added grace, his provision. We've gone here's what here's what it amounts to. You've gone from uh, you've gone from common grace to efficacious grace to saving grace to logistical grace alpha to super grace, logistical, bra, bra, uh, logistical grace, bravo, to ultra super grace, to dying grace. See, you're going to keep on growing in grace. So God has already provided the following things, grace, peace, everything pertaining to physical life, everything pertaining to spiritual life, precious promises and magnificent promises. He's already done that. Now you have those six th things. If you happen to be superstitious, I know this is going to add up to 13. Just change the number on one of these, okay? The next seven are moral excellence. You add knowledge, that's epinosis knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, agape love. Folks, therein lays the Christian life. Verse 8 now is going to give us the benefits of adding these things in 7. So we're going to get some benefits. Watch this in verse 7, uh, verse 8. He said, for if these qualities, that's the seven things we've just met, just added, moral excellence to agape love. He said, if these things, if these qualities, these seven things just listen, are yours, that means you already have them. This is not you're getting them. You're thinking about getting them. You already have them. He said, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, abounding to wider action, they, these seven qualities, do not make you useless. That means your life is going to be fruitful. You're going to have a fruitful Christian life. This is where the Christian life makes a difference, not only in you, to God, but to the people you come in contact with. There's your usefulness. Now watch what he says. They do not make you useless nor unproductive. That means you're being productive in the Christian way of life. In the true knowledge, epinosis, full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 8, then, because you have these things, this is what the benefit is. Production, profit, profitable. Now, watch in verse 9. 
might not want to watch it. Might not want to see this one. In verse nine, this gives us the downside of failing to add these seven things. Are you listening to me? This is the Christian way of life. For whatever reason, we don't add these things. We don't have them. He said, for the one, that's a reversionistic believer, for the one who lacks, keeps on lacking. That's not just lacking now, but they keep on lacking. They stay in reversionism. For the one who keeps on lacking these, these qualities, the seven things listed, is, is what? That word is indicates an absolute status quo of the reversionistic believer. That means here you are, you're not getting out of there. What are they? He said, you're blind. You're blind. You never discover the Christian life and what it's all about. <coughs> not only not only might you be blind, another alternative is you're short-sighted. What does that mean? That means you're disoriented to the Christian way of life. Well, I've, uh, uh, it, the Christian way of life is going this way, and you're going whoop, this way. You're disoriented. And what have you done? You have forgotten your purf purification from your personal sins. When were you purified? You were purified the moment you were saved. God said your old man went back on the cross with Jesus, your old woman back on the cross with Jesus, your old sin nature was there, the flesh was there, you have a new man, new woman, walk in him. That's what the Christian way of life's about. <laughs> now look in verse 10. Verse 10 indicates, therefore, brothers and sisters, he's talking to born again believers, therefore, born again believers, Brothers and sisters, he said, be the more diligent. We just saw that word back a few verses ago. Be diligent. Move on. Keep moving, keep moving forward. This word diligent means to make an all-out effort. Not a half, not a half an effort, an all-out effort. To make or to keep on making. So you're not just going to make, you're going to keep on making, making what? Making certain. What you want to do is you want to get to a point in your life when you step when you have established beyond a shadow of a doubt. About what? About your calling. And his calling. You've been called by by God. So what you want to do is establish beyond a shadow of a doubt. I have been called of God. I've been elected. I have this Christian way of life. And then he says, now look at this. He says, for as long as you do what? What's the next word? For as long as you what? One more time. For as long as you what? What does that mean? That means do it. He said, for as long as you apply, 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 do, do, do these things, the seven things listed, you will never what? You will never stumble how how well does that set with somebody that indicates you have to sin every day how well does that set how does that look doesn't make it it doesn't make any sense does it he said here it is if you do these things you will never stumble now i would suggest this doesn't happen when you're a babe in christ this doesn't happen when you're an adolescent in christ you're gaining on it, but when you become a mature believer and break into spiritual maturity, spiritual self-esteem, there is your first, there's your first glimpse of what the Christian way of life is totally all about once you reach spiritual maturity. Well, then why do you need to go from spiritual self-esteem to spiritual autonomy to this maximum spiritual maturity? We know that when you're already you've already grown as much as you can, you can't grow anymore. Than getting to spiritual adulthood. What you're going to do is you're going to increase your capacity from spiritual self esteem, spiritual self esteem, spiritual autonomy, spiritual maturity. What were you, what were you expanding? Your capacities for what? Blessing and suffering. That's it. See, as a mature believer, you're going to, you're going to expand your capacity for suffering and blessing in the Christian way of life. You already have everything you know, need to know to live out the Christian way of life as a mature believer. Now, the question is this, and I ask this, I ask this in humility and with as much objectivity as I can. What part of never do most Christians not understand? 
you will, he says, you will never stumble. That, I didn't, that's not my comment. That's God's comment through Peter. Let's move on. He says in verse 11, for in this way, adding these seven things, he said the entrance, that's admission into the eternal kingdom. That's, listen, that's not, the, that's not the millennial kingdom. See, the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom are two different things. In the eternal kingdom, a resurrection, in, in, the, in the millennium, in the millennial kingdom, because you are in a resurrection body and you are saved, you are in the eternal kingdom and you are also in the millennial kingdom. But this is talking about the eternal kingdom. This is when you get saved. He said, for in this way, adding the seven things, the entrance into the eternal kingdom, the third heaven of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. The supply when we get there is going to be amazing. The moment you die, you enter into this. You're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, the third heaven, the moment you're saved. Now, in verse 12, we get the reality and importance of the word of God. See, that's where we started. Without the word of God, there is no word from God. So here's the, here's the reality and importance of the word of God. Therefore, because of this, now, and what is, what is this? What is therefore? Because of your orientation to grace in verses 1 through 11. Verses 1 through 11 establish the grace principle, God's provision. Here it is. This is what I have for you. Therefore, because of your orientation to grace in verses 1 through 11, Peter says, I, Peter, I will always be ready. Watch this. He said, remember, he's about to die. He said, I will always be ready to remind. That means to keep on reminding, means to keep on reminding, keep on reminding, keep on reminding you using the authority of an apostle. See, Peter was an apostle. Remember, Apostles had all authority in every church when they walked through the door. You have a pastor, but before 96 AD, the, the canon of scripture is not complete. These apostles were given special authority by God the Father in the establishment of the, the, uh, the, the assembly of, um, of Christians. So Peter walks in, he has authority. He said, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you, to keep on reminding you, believers, concerning these things. Concerning what? These seven things. So, Dennis, what that means is Peter walks in and says, hey, look, I know I told you this last week. You heard this last seven, seven weeks ago. I was here a long time before. You've heard this 15 times from me. You said, Peter, you sound like a broken record. And Peter says, Dennis, let me say this one more time. Therefore, he said, I will always be reminded, ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. You tell me, look, if I've already know this, why are you talking to me? He's going to tell you why. You know that when, the, when things begin to blow up out here, your circumstances, if you're not a mature believer, there's going to be somewhere along the line you get tripped up. This is why God wants you to be a mature believer so that when you get to evidence testing, you've passed providential preventive suffering test. You've, pro, you've passed the momentum test in spiritual adulthood. Now you're ready for the you're ready for evidence testing. Boy, this is when God says, Satan, there, she, there he is, there she is. You can do everything to him but this. And he starts out, he starts out after you. See, because you have functioned in grace and you have developed this capacity for grace, capacity for suffering, you are now able to handle whatever Satan brings your way. Guess what? That's an answer in the angelic conflict. And the answer comes from you. Therefore, he said, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, these seven things, even though you already know them, they're permanently reside in your right lobe and launching pad of the soul, even though you know them and have established them. There they are, they're down the launching pad. You have been established in truth by means of truth, which is present with you. So he says, I'm getting ready to remind you. I'll remind you every time I, I see you. Verse 13, he said, I, Peter, I consider it right. It's my phase two duty. This is my duty. As long as I am in this earthly dwelling, that means as long as he's alive physically, he said, I'm going to stir you up. I'm going to come in and say, um, Ford, I'm going to tell you again and again. Now, remember, I'm a pastor teacher. And I want, I think we need to understand this. 
You know me as your pastor teacher, but you also know me as Jim Bertell. I may be with you as Jim Bertell, but I'm also your pastor. And there may be a time when I need to say to you, Dennis, I told you before, what's going on, brother? As a matter, you say, as a matter of fact, you told me two or three times, Dr. Jim. See, this is what this is what life is all about. I don't like this, but I didn't ask for this gift, but I got it. You've got your gift, and you're going to use it, aren't you? You've got your gift, and you're going to use it. As a pastor teacher, I'm going to use mine. He said, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up, to awaken you by means of a what? By means of a reminder. That doesn't mean I'm going to slap you. It's a reminder. Then he goes on, verse 14. In verse 14, Peter knows, of, knows his physical death is near. Verse 14, the approaching death of Peter, knowing, he said, with dogmatic certainty, that the laying aside of his physical body, his earthly dwelling, that means he's, he's, he's getting ready to die. His body is simply a temporary dwelling. He said, I, knowing that my physical death is imminent, it's near at hand. As also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear, has pointed out to me. In other words, Jesus has pointed out, Peter, it's about over. And in verse 15, he says, and I, Peter, I will also be diligent, strongly motivated, strongly driven. As a pastor teacher, I say to you with love, compassion, I will also be diligent, strongly motivated, strongly driven. That And the word that introduces the purpose for which Peter is going to be strongly, strongly motivated. At any time, always and at all times, after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Question. Why did, why did Peter keep going over and 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 I know many overs over again? Why did he do that? What's that? Really? Well, I'll be darned. Yeah, you're right, Samson. That's right. So should you be offended when I tell you I've told you this 16 times? How about 17? Okay. See, he won't be, and listen, what I was just thinking that, you know, I, uh, at age, at my age, at the age of some of you, uh, you may go before me. But if I go before you, which is what most people think should happen, but if I go before you, I want you to remember what I told you. But you're not going to remember if I don't tell you again and again. See, that's the idea. Now, here's some principles. We'll get these very quickly now because we've got four minutes. Here we go. Principles. Number one, doctrine goes on in spite of death or removal of any Christian leader or, or the removal of any great Christian. Peter knows he's going to die, but he wants that doctrine to go on. It's going on whether he, whether he dies or not. See, Peter, in fact, will die. But although he may die, Doctrine goes on forever. If I die before you do, doctrine's going to go on. You're going to keep going on. Point number three. Obviously, then, it isn't the man. See, this is, uh, this is what I understand. It's not the man. It's the what? It's the message. It's the message. See, men, may, men will go on, but the word of God will abide forever. Now, the, why men? Why do you say just men? No, hold it now. He's talking about communicators, okay? Men will go on, but the word of God will abide forever. Five, the greatest thing a pastor can do for a congregation is teach doctrine. Feed them that which is permanent. Six, if the pastor fulfills this function, his departure will not upset the stability of the congregation. Why? Their stability is doctrine, not personality. And seven, believers must depend on doctrine rather than depending on an outstanding personality. Okay? Well, it's 11, 12. We got three minutes to pray. Samson, pray for us, will you, buddy? Okay.
Amen. Folks, we're going to shut it down now. We'll be back again this coming Wednesday. God bless you. And we'll be meeting back here again first Sunday of the month of, this is uh, May of June. First Sunday of June. God bless you and good day.